Hey everybody, welcome to the Growing with Fishes podcast. I'm Steve. And I'm Marty. Um, we do this show every week or almost every week um, to help promote aquaponic cannabis growing um, as well as aquaponic growing and cannabis growing separately. Um, we um we go over this stuff a bunch of different topics every week and um uh yeah we have a good time and try to cover politics and nutrients and grow methods and all different types of things so thanks for joining us sorry for the late start today we are having i'm still having all kinds of technical problems with my uh with my end i'm not really sure what happened everything was working fine and then um it was acting a little funny and decided to reconnect and disconnect and then everything went haywire so I'm not, i don't like to be a conspiracy theorist but it was right after you made that joke about the cia it was it was <laughs> so i was telling him the building where the office where my office is at the mo now and where um is uh an old um and where i'm working with key to life and stuff at there it's an old cia they had like high profile protection people and stuff through there um and it's all like bulletproof and all kinds of crazy stuff but they have a tower there we were thinking about trying to get the licensing permission to get do like a cannabis radio or something crazy in denver um who knows if it'll ever happen, but it was just something that we were thinking about, joking about. Um, but yeah, that's what he was referring to. So how's um, your week been, Steve? The week been, the week's been good. We've been working on, um, <laughs> my life's been totally crazy. So, before I go back to Jamaica, I'm going back out to, or I'm going out to Humboldt. Um, we'll be out in Humboldt working on some projects out there. So we'll have some really cool footage of some stuff out in Humboldt. And um, uh, starting after the 15th. And um, what else do we have? Yeah, a bunch of different stuff going on. Um, we have a bunch of different things in the cooker. Um, there's some cool stuff coming in the pipeline and the nutrient end. Um, some cool new delivery methods and some cool stuff you guys haven't seen before um, that we've been cooking up. Um, yeah, it's pretty dope. Um, trying to think what else. Nothing, just I'm about to move my grow <clears throat> that you guys have seen in the videos over to a buddy of mine's house here in a week or so when he gets back. Um, and that'll be, uh, you'll continue to see videos and stuff from that setup. Um, just, I'm giving it to someone that can take care of it and will listen to, you know, instruction and all that while I'm gone and things. And they're going to take good care of it and be able to uh, keep keep good doing those video series like I was doing before I left for Jamaica. So um, that'll be really, really good for everybody to see uh, more aquaponic grow and stuff. Um, Couldn't uh, talk your girlfriend into doing it anymore, huh? Well, she's just got a bunch of other stuff going on right now. and She's actually got, and I'll see if I can get some footage before I head out from, from Colorado here on the, uh, up in, um, up north of here, um, up at a big hemp, hemp farm. Um, we're actually doing a big test with biochar in the field with hemp. So... We'll see how that works out. It'll be really cool to see. That sounds cool. Yeah. And then uh, what else do we have going on? I think that's about it for now. Some other things going on, but I can't talk about those. Um, There was one other thing. Shoot. Oh, yeah. We'll be out. I'll be out popping around on the... Um, on the west coast if anyone's looking to uh to get together i'll be out um between in northern california and oregon 
um, uh, the end of July. So if anyone's around there, definitely let me know. I'll be up uh, visiting Marty and stuff. So um, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, definitely let me know. That sounds cool. And then you said you'll be in Humboldt around the 15th, right? Yeah, yeah. And then after that, I'll be in the Humboldt for at least through the through the winter, at the least at the moment. Well, until I go back to, unless, you know, whenever our stuff gets further along in Jamaica um, and our gear gets there and all, um, we'll go back down. But that won't be for at least a month and a half at the earliest. So takes about a month and a half to get everything together and get it shipped. So whenever that is ready to roll, we'll head back down there. And then we have some other stuff going on in the Caribbean, and some of the other Caribbean islands that we'll be put, putting together. Um, actually, I have a call with, about that tomorrow, um, about all that stuff. So, um, yeah, we'll have some other stuff to, to show off to you guys later once it's finalized and all that. <clears throat> what about you um well not not a whole lot's been going on garden wise pretty much just been maintaining at this point <clears throat> everything's looking pretty good getting some pretty good growth um you know the i haven't had a top water in a in a while so that hasn't been an issue so i give them tea about twice a week and that's about it um, so the the indoor is probably like you know two weeks or week and a half or so into flower, so not much happening there yet either. How do you, how do you um, like the dual root zone plants so far versus um, the non that that you've grown in the past? Well, I haven't noticed too big of a difference. Now, you know, I think I'm probably at the point in. Um, in the indoor to where you know if i was going to top dress with something else um you know now would basically be the time to do it <clears throat> and you know when they're about two weeks in the flower and they start you know getting ready to start really sucking up some nutrients to start forming flowers and you know pre-flowers and all that so um so i've just been the same stuff that i've dosed into the system before whether it was in the tank or in the bed or whatever um, the same worm juice, essentially, that I mixed up before, I'm just putting into the dual root zone. And um, so in the outdoor, I definitely notice that the plants are more stable in the wind, so I don't have to worry about them. Like, did it, were, none of them really broke last year, even though we had, like, you know, 40 mile an hour gusts. They were all, you know, all the stalks were very healthy, but what would happen is the plant would tip over in the media. So... Um, it would just be the stock is still straight. It's not bent over. It's not crooked. It's not snapped, but it just the whole plant ships over, which isn't wasn't really a big deal. But um, I did notice that the you know having a little bit more of a base prevents that from happening. So that that's definitely been a bonus. And um, yeah, other than that, it, you know, I haven't really noticed too much of a difference. Um, it, I haven't really noticed like a, you know. Um, like a functional wise, there doesn't really seem to be a difference once you set them up. Um, like you've talked about before, you can dose plants individually if you need to, but I haven't really had to do that. So um, pretty much everybody's just gotten the same thing. So so far, so so good. I guess I I like it just fine. And it's all just um, you know all my stuff is castings. I'm not mixing anything else with it i'm trying to continue just making all of my own stuff so my soil layer is essentially just dirt from my backyard mixed about 50 50 with just straight worm castings from the bottom of my worm bin which i think was a question at one point somebody asked if you can do just castings for a soil layer and uh, i didn't do 100 percent, but i did 50 50 and that uh seems to be working fine yeah, if you do a hundred percent, it can kind of lock together and get kind of like a mud solid at the bottom and reduce airflow. So that's the downside to using a hundred percent. That's why I wouldn't recommend. You know, even if you want to do a hundred percent, cut it with like perlite. Perlite, or, yeah, uh, that's what I can say too. Perlite or coca cola or something else that's gonna, you know, really reduce that amount of, you know, add some aeration. 
and reduce its lock, you know, the ability to lock up like that. Right. And then I, I also, um, I did, you know, the bottom layer inside of the pot I did with just hydrogen. So there's probably a solid, like, you know, a third of the pot that is just straight hydrogen before the layer of, um, I just used the food grade liner, the same just scraps that I had from other stuff to make, cut some holes in the bottom of it so that, um, to create uh, the, a barrier that would be non-wicking uh, barrier between the soil and the hydrogen. And then my, uh, the bottom of the, the bottom of the pot goes about a half inch below the water at its highest level. So the siphon comes in to the bottom of the pot only about a half inch. So it should only be hitting the hydrogen. So that's how I set up each one of these. and. I haven't noticed any issues with like, you know, soil getting sucked into the bed or anything like that. But for the most part, I don't, don't even move it. So sorry about that. So I guess I, I wouldn't know what it was until it, you know, fell down in the middle or something, I suppose. But damn Marty, you popular. I know. People don't leave me alone. My dad <coughs> and my wife. So anyway, you can take it if you think it's important by all means. No, it's he's just uh, old. <laughs> I'll talk. He'll text me. It'll be fine. Good. Oh, oh. I also got a text from the. One of the people that's uh, in the Right to Grow group that we've talked about before. Word. Uh, let's see. Interesting. So, yeah, I haven't really talked about that yet, but I got my, this is my, I'm not going to show it on camera, but this is my extortion letter from uh, Jackson County that um highlights <clears throat> how i have to pay their 1500 hundred dollar fee if i want to grow outside so that's going to be fun we um so i talked to them about their lawsuit that's what she was just texting me about um because hopefully i'll be able to apply for the permit without paying for it um so that at least until their court case is resolved, which is supposed to be within the next like week or so anyway. So, uh, but they've said that for like two weeks now. So I guess that's a little bit hard to believe too, but at any rate, um, they have a lawyer that's going to draft up a letter. Yeah. Uh, is going to draft up a, a letter that basically we can put in along with our application that essentially says like, we're not going to pay $1,500 right now because um, if we pay you $1,500 and then the court case prevents you from enforcing these regulations, there's no way we're gonna get our $1,500 back. So, cause it's just for a farm use permit. So it's not like, uh, you know, it's specific for cannabis growing. So even though they're using it that way, they would still just go ahead with the application and give me a farm use permit, even though I wouldn't technically need one for any sure. other reason. Just get some goats and some chickens and just go. If you got the, the farm use permit, man, just, just go full obnoxious with it. I really That's you know, the thing, why not? I can have goats and chickens. <laughs> That's the ridiculous part about it. Like, there's no problem with that. Whatever would allow you're allowed to do with the farm use thing. Bring in some kind of crazy ass tractor that just keeps your neighbor up late at night. <laughs> so the, back out. And I, I know it's this asshole that's right fucking there. I, I know it's him. Nobody else can even like you can't see my grow at all from like the front yard. My two neighbors on either side can see it. And then other than that, my property backs up against the wetlands that's right here behind it. You can't even build anything within two hundred and fifty feet of the back fence out here so there's literally nothing there for probably like i don't know two miles so it's just it's stupid and it's all just to keep people from being able to grow and to enable people like this guy next door to be able to get his panties in a bunch and file a complaint about his 
pot growing neighbor. <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, hopefully I'll be able to, I'm going to apply, I'm going to send the letter. I'm still going to apply for it, but send the letter that says, you know, we're, you know, essentially supposed to wait. And I'm, you're, <laughs> I'm supposed to be able to grow because all I have is my card and my four recreational plants. So I should be able to grow my 10 plants regardless, but for whatever reason, and it says right here on the piece of paper, other that, that pretty much that we're, they're required to let us grow our four recreational plants and one patient. So that's 10 plants on property, except for like this very specific area, which I happen to be in. So I'm not really sure like, you know, <laughs> what what the deal is. Because even if I was in just residential property that wasn't in this particular area right here, which they deemed urban residential, even though I'm not even technically in any, any city limits, I'm just on county property, but I'm like sandwiched between two cities. So if I was a little bit farther in either way, I would be inside of city limits. So it's just this weird... Uh, inclusive area to where they're they're treating this entire area like it's still inside of the city that it's not inside of so my theory is there must be like a council member's dad or something that lives over here <laughs> or some ridiculous crap like that or property values they're probably trying to manipulate property values for some well I guess for profit I guess technically right so that's what I I've been dealing with is trying to decide how I want to move forward with that. So I'm hoping that I'll either do one of two things. Either I'm going to pay the $1,500 and then hopefully be able to have more plants. So I'll go find like three more patients and be able to have 24 total plants. And I'm going to line his fucking fence with giant plants. Um, and then uh, I'll just like do all my trimming on the front porch, which is right like facing his porch. So that'll be good too. I'm just going to like bring it, I'm going to like hang it from the rafters out here in front. Just be like, I got my permit. You can call whoever you want. I like get a big industrial fan to like blow the smell in his direction. <laughs> Burn all the trim right in your yard. 55 gallon drums blowing the smoke right in his house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to find, like, the most Rasta-looking dudes that I can find and just sit on my porch, like, 24-7 and just, like, blast music and do nothing but trim weed and roll fat joints. <laughs> just be like, every chance, every time he walks outside, I want him to be like... You walk out and be like, hey, man, can I yeah. help you with your trash bun? <laughs> every time, man. Be like, you want to hit? Just, yeah. Just, I'm so sick of smoke it, itself. Look, I tried to take the high road. Like, I have my shit way in the back. Like, you can't even see it. Like, if he's yeah. even up here at his house, there, there's no way that he's even going to smell it from back there, even in full flower. Like, maybe a little bit, but at least I've been tried to be considerate. I don't, like, the neighbor who grows on the other side is definitely not. So, you know, he, like, he does basically that. He opens up his garage door in the front and sets up loud speakers and music and has a bunch of his friends over and they all, trim in his garage and in his driveway and everything and it pisses off the neighbors so you know at this point i'm thinking about going that route like why the fuck not yeah you get to have your drunken barbecues whenever you feel like it and invite your son over that yells at everybody yeah. so why not <clears throat> i just you know it's just annoying they're not even in flower yet the plants are like i don't know two feet tall <laughs> And there are, I have already filed their complaint. It's just, it's ridiculous. I don't understand who's petty in that way. So it's ridiculous. Enough venting about that, I suppose. Because other than that, everything looks great. I, I think I you probably saw I posted a couple of pictures yesterday. So yeah, it's been looking looking real good. Getting lots of new girls. Everything's nice. been been pretty much on the same i've been comparing it to last year and i got i put out a little sooner this year but as far as like if i count it from when i got everything set up and things established then it's uh you know pretty much seems to be on about the same pace so i'll, I'll be pretty happy with that if i 
can reproduce the same results as last year, then that'll be good. And hopefully I'll have a little bit bigger plans just because, you know, they'll have like an extra probably about two weeks worth of veg time this year than they didn't have last year. Nice. So, yeah. how You said you're going to move your system, right? How is that? Are you just going to load it up and... Yeah, we're like, just going to take it, take it down, take the flour down, then take the veg down, and then set them back up. So, so you, are you going to wait till you're like in between flower cycles, or are you just going to try and move the whole bed? Right now, the flower, this flower room is pretty much empty. There's one plant that just needs, needs to get taken down. And then... Um, cool. Uh, that room will be ready to just get disassembled and moved um but it's not gonna get moved until uh, my buddy gets back in town he's out of town next week so he leaves tomorrow so yeah but yeah we'll be it'll be good because we'll be able to get you know much more a lot more footage out of that so yeah that's cool yeah i was just trying to figure out what to do with it because i won't be around I'm going to be bopping around so much. I just wanted to make sure we can get some kind of constant footage out of it, trying to set it up so that we can have, you know, can start doing weekly videos from the system again like we used to do. Yeah, I try to shoot for once a week at least. Seems to be pretty reasonable. Oh, yeah. So, I, um... I had an interesting thing that uh, I wanted to bring up that I found out. So there's the whole thing going around about the DEA rescheduling. And nobody really knows what's going to happen yet. Um, some people get their panties in a bunch or whatever about it. Um, there's a lot of crazy implications on what could happen depending on how, how the ruling is implemented. Um, and what they decided to reschedule it to. But uh, one thing I wanted to bring up on that is, is that Scott's, um, who's owned by Monsanto, is suddenly trying to buy up like every fertilizer company that you can think of that's a smaller company. I'm not going to name any, but I know of at least six or eight companies that are smaller um, nutrient companies that a lot of people use. That have all gotten like crazy offers from them. Um, so I'm just kind of curious if they don't know something that the rest of us don't as far as which way legalization is going, which would explain why they're trying to gobble up all these other companies. Yeah, I heard a little bit about that. I think somebody, somebody posted, I don't know if it was just one of my friends or if it was in a group or not, but they were talking about that that same thing. Yeah, Scott's has been throwing offers at everybody under the sun lately. So I just found that very interesting, and I don't know, might be a good sign as far as the legalization war. Not to look into it too much, because who knows, but it would seem that way. Um, the, I would, there's some other cool stuff that happened this week. There's the um, California is going to get their legalization ballot. Um, I know there's controversy as far as how the ballot in initiative is. I don't actually know a whole bunch about it yet. I'm going to actually educate myself on it before I, you know, pick a stance on it. I need to. So, um, I'm going to read up on it the next week or two. Um, especially since I'll be out there for the fall. Or at least a good chunk of it. Um, what was it? Oh, yeah. So they did a, a, a big study in, um, in cannabis in regards to Alzheimer's. And they found that it helps remove plaque-forming proteins from the brain as well as other parts of the body and, and flush them from the body. Um, THC especially. So that was pretty, pretty cool um, to see that, you know, especially for those old, older brain diseases that cannabis can have a huge impact. Um, you know, that, that's huge. 
Um, and then the other one was is that Columbia is giving out its first medical uh, cannabis license. So you could see some Colombian uh, cannabis here before uh, uh, once the U.S. ever gets their uh, act together with importing. But um, Colombia is going to start growing cannabis. So interesting to see what happens down there with that. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting as the rest of the world starts to, you know, rethink the way they deal with cannabis, how, you know, how and when rescheduling happens. And, you know, obviously there's so many, there's a lot of different options for them to reschedule it too. And all of those have, you know, different impacts on the way it's going to get dealt with. So it's going to be interesting if they, you know, if they do it and also when they do it. And then again, on top of that, where they reschedule it to, all of those have different, different outcomes, I think. Um, so some of the other stuff I want to talk about is um, uh, the nutrient I want to talk about this week was manganese. Um uh, manganese is uh, uh, one of the nutrients that gets depleted in an aquaponic system, especially older aquaponic systems. Um, if you look at um, both Dr. Leonard and Dr. Ricosi's stuff, their longer term depletion levels, um, it was depleted in both of them. Um, and there's some other stuff that we've done back at my old job that in working with aquaponics that showed that it does get depleted over time. Um, there's just isn't much in any of your food or any other sources that are being inputs into your system. Um, it, it is also uh, it will show as a, an iron deficiency or ironish deficiency in an older system, like a year plus um, in a system where you otherwise have been dosing iron and everything else seems, you know, kind of okay. Um, and usually it doesn't happen until at least six, six to 12 months into the system's age. Um, really easy and cheap to replace, um, and it's responsible for photosynthesis, respiration, and nitrogen assimilation, um, similar to how we were talking about the molybdenum helping make the nitrogen available to the plant. Um, right, right. Uh, it helps manganese. the nitrification process, right? Yeah. So manganese also helps with that process as far as the, the proteins and things that are involved with that. Um, so... The ideal manganese level is 0.5 to 1 parts per million for an aquaponic system for cannabis. And then your mang you want to use manganese chloride um, which or manganese sulfate. But, um, neither one of them will have any effect on your pH uh, much at all. And then um, uh, especially in the dosages that you're going to use them with. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, it's just a, a one of those few things that, especially in older systems, you know, maybe you dose it once every six months to a year kind of thing. You know, if you're going to dose it uh, just directly, you know, as far as mineral wise. Well, speaking of which, I got that um, that iron from the aquaponics store. The, was it true true aquaponics store? Right, we had Roger on a couple of weeks ago. For and uh, so I ordered that up. I'm going to go grab that real quick so I can show everybody what that looks like. I'll be right back. Uh, so, yeah, we've been working with a, our, uh, what was it here? a couple of different things here. Um, so one of the other things I wanted to bring up this week, I've been going around to some different places lately, is... Um, I wanted to talk about um, uh, early detection of, in, of mites and other insects um, and, and some early detection methods, um, especially mites at this time of year is, you know, spring to early summer. Um, now's a, I mean, mites spreading is real common this time of year. Um, so, you know, get real, real low to the ground or as low, you know, lower than the plants are. Crouch and then look up towards the sky if it's an outdoor or your grow lights if it's an indoor, and and just look for speckling or, or, or dots on on the the leaves, especially the lower leaves at first, um, as well as the the very upper leaves. Um, 
and and just look for those to see if you have any any mite damage and, and if you see the speckling then take a closer look and remove a leaf and take a look at the bottom and, and give it a real good close look and and check it for mites and make sure you don't have any mite issues especially this time of year um, they can accelerate real quickly and you don't want that so um, it's definitely something that you know is real easy to check for and again it's something I can't emphasize especially this time of year um, is getting real low to the ground checking your plants once a day and just putting your eyes in front of each plant 15 to 30 seconds a day even if you're in a hurry that day or whatever just just put your eyeballs in front of it and give the plant a good once over with your eyes and give it a good close look and just make sure you don't see any new damage or you know anything like that and um you know maybe once a week pull the plants over to where you can get them good lit and give them a good spin around and 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 you know check them you know depending on on how your grows laid out but make sure you give them a good good once over every once a week every week or two at the very least but you know definitely check, try to check them every other day or every day if you can but you know because if you don't especially this time of year the the temperatures and everything those those guys will take off quick and they can wreck a whole grove real quick and um you know i've seen some people lately with with some early ones that didn't quite catch it real quick and um you know it wasn't too bad yet but you know we uh definitely were able to show them that they had uh, some stuff going on and catch it before it was an issue but you know you got to be careful especially this time of year you there <clears throat> yeah can you hear me yep okay good i think i lost my video though i'm not sure yep. my camera started freaking out apparently it's a thing today yeah apparently google uh Google Hangouts just hates everything at the stream today. It's been fighting this tooth and nail the whole afternoon. Um, <laughs> the other topics I wanted to touch on, uh, and I was going over this a lot in Jamaica, and then I've been going over this a lot lately too with some people in Colorado, is um, topping, pinching, and bending. So every time the plant puts out a node, um, or every two or three times the plant puts out a node actually, and a node is where a new leaf and a new branch comes out. Um, you want to cut the top of the plant off on the, on the taller the taller parts of the branches, or the tallest branches or the center stalk, um, so that it terminates that and the plant branches out and the lower nodes right below it get more, more growth and you end up with more branches and more tops. Um, that was, uh, especially in Jamaica, was a whole new concept to a bunch of the people that I was working with, and um, you know, they just hadn't been exposed to that before. Um, one of the other methods too I wanted to bring up is if you you know once you get comfortable with topping, which is pretty easy, you know, you're just taking off the very top, maybe quarter to eighth of an inch, just the very very tippy top of the plant, um, just the very very top of the growth. You're just trying to terminate. The, the stalk or the branch growth. You're not trying to do anything else. So, you know, peel back as many branches as you can so there's just the top little cluster of, of um, green leaves and, and just trim that off. There's also a method called fimming called fuck I missed or, sh you know, F I missed or whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's where you cut it in half um, and you don't completely cut the node, the top terminal node. And, um, that allows sometimes for three or four branches, but sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes you just get to anyway. And I don't know. I don't know. I, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it's another method. I at least wanted to mention. Um, right or super cropping also. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> another thing, thing that you can do. Yep, yeah, that was the next thing I was going to mention: is super cropping, which is where you take the top of the plant or somewhere near the top of the plant or taller branches, especially. Um, earlier on in the plant's life and you pinch it as hard as you can until you crush the inside of it you'll feel it kind of go together and then squeeze it you know kind of two finger widths high and give it a good squeeze and then bend it over um, it'll flop one way or the other and you can direct it which way you want it to go and all that 
And you can either basket weave the plants together in an outdoor situation to give them a little wind stability, or you can, um, um, in an indoor, you can bend them down right before you scrog them so the plants are all ready to get scrogged out in your, in your nets and stuff. And it helps a lot with that. Um, and it also helps when you pinch it, um, it causes the circulation to get dramatically reduced in the portion that you pinched off at the end. And what that does is it acts similar to like your, um, there's a, pro, a hormone that gets produced uh, when the plant goes to sleep at night. And it also has an effect when the plant doesn't get circulation. Um, and that builds up in the ed upper end of that plant where the post bend. And what that does is it, it causes the root, the nodes and the flowers and the branches on that upper part to get much, much more of uh, that um, branching flowering hormone um, before it, you know, fixes its circulation and gets a good knob on it on the end and, and you know, works real well. Um, but what that does is it gives you a real a big increase in your, your node growth and your branching and you'll get a bushier plant that way. Um, the other one I've heard of, and this was recently I was shown, it was twisting and cracking where you take a branch and you twist it until it cracks on the inside. Um, and then you can bend it that way as well, which I haven't done too much before, but I met two people that recently that, that do it a lot and um, found that pretty interesting. Yeah, I saw that on a, somebody's YouTube video that they did it that way too, and I actually tried it in my last indoor grow. I tried both twisting and pinching um, both, and, you know, it really does the same thing as long as you snap that inner, you know, inner stock of the plant or whatever you want to call it, then, um, you know, I think however you do that, whether you twist it or you snap it, as long as you can do that without splitting the outside of it, um, you know, that's, that's essentially that. And even if you do split it, you can, you know, obviously just wrap it a little bit and it will definitely repair itself but I think ideally you want to be able to just snap the inside without splitting the outside so uh, we had somebody in chat with a question um, yeah this is, where can I order tilapia babies um, you can order tilapia babies online I know there's a couple of different websites I know there's I think it's White Brook Farms, and then there's Tilapia Source or Tilapia Depot, something like that. Um, and there's a couple of different websites you can order from. Or on a lot of states, um, you can look up your local state's fish and game website, and they'll have a certified um, a list of certified vendors of game fish. And almost all of those guys have some tilapia or can get them in. Um, and you can always find the guy that's near you, um, and they can just get them in for you, or they might even have them in stock. If not, they can direct you to someone that's legally certified in your state, um, you know, to direct you to. Yeah, here in Oregon, they have a list um, of, that you can get from the state that is all the hatcheries that are certified by the state and to sell different kinds of fish. So it's usually just a PDF you download off their website. That's what it is here in Oregon, anyway. Yep, most states are easy. Not all states, but <laughs> right. you know, such as the U.S. He also asks, um, "You have a curing question. What is your curing question, Mr. Tyler?" <laughs> other topics or what other things did you have going on lately or things that have come up uh, not too much I'm still babysitting the catfish eggs um, so uh, you know they should be from what I understand they should only be about 10 days or so before you start being able to see them inside the eggs so some of them are turning different colors so like some of them are turning a dark color but I haven't you know they're under the water so I haven't really yeah. like got down there to see but I would assume that you're you know that the dark color is being able to see the the fry starting to form inside so still babysitting those but other than that they're still just fish eggs and um, yeah not, not really too much system wise that's it 
pretty much it. And then um, I went and got this uh, iron from the Shiro Aquaponics store to be able to show you guys, but now uh, Google Video is not cooperating, so <laughs> show you that. But uh, I did order that from there, and it was relatively easy to, to mix in. And um, I just did a little bit because I already have iron in my water, but I wanted to be able to have this to show you guys, so I guess I'll do that next week. Um, so, yeah. I think that's pretty much it for me. I don't really have too much else going on um, uh, other than the legal stuff, which I already ranted about and don't want to rant again about. So that's pretty yeah, much so that. Do you want to talk any more about the lawsuit that's going on there? Is there any updates or anything with that? Or um, Well, it's pretty much coming to a head. They are pretty much going to have to rule on it within the next few days. So that will basically, if they... And the injunction is already filed. So basically, if the lawsuit gets accepted, and the, then they have to accept the injunction, which will prevent them from enforcing any of the laws that are involved in the lawsuit that has already been accepted. So that means that as long as the both of those two get accepted, then I won't have to pay or do anything. They won't be able to enforce any of that stuff, any of those regulations that have to do with uh, growing inside or outside or the it, it increased regulations on plants because where I'm at currently for the state, I should be able to have at least 24 plants if I want to do reporting, which means I have to track all my seeds and clones and how much uh, product they produce and where it goes. and. They have a whole list of things that you have to report if you want to do that, if you want to be registered for another grower. So even then, that means that I could have, uh, you know, four patients at six plants each. That's 24 plants plus my four recreational. That would be 28, but I'm limited to 10 by Jackson County. So hopefully all that stuff will happen, but who knows if it actually will or not. Uh, I don't have a ton of faith in our legal system, so um, I guess I'm preparing for the worst. So I'll be basically doing as much as I can legally. And, uh, yeah, I think that's probably the most important thing is whether or not those two things get accepted because then that uh, will at least prevent them from coming in and tearing out my plans. So other than that, that's pretty much what will happen is if I – don't take them out, then they, you know, it's not like they'll arrest me, which they'll do in most states, but they'll come out and tear out all of my outdoor plants. Mm -hmm. Nice of them, right? Yeah, fucking some dicks about everything. Yes, it is true. And I, I'm pretty sure my neighbor used to work for the county, so that's why he has. That's why he made sure all of his paperwork was very thoroughly filled out. So it wasn't even like a week after my, well, yeah, I guess it was probably like not quite two weeks after I put plants in the ground that he had all of this done and somebody out to take a look at it. So, Did you have any, um, any other products for the, uh, can I use it this week? That's the one thing I didn't have time to uh, go grab anything for this week. Well, I guess I can talk about it even though I can't show, which is what I got for that was this iron chelate from Roger over at True Aquaponics, which is basically just a, a powder of iron chelate, 11%, you know, food grade. Um, and, uh, you know, it's relatively simple to use. You can mix it into a water solution and pour it in is probably what I would suggest. You know, they have a whole uh, sheet um that comes with it that explains how to calculate how much you should put in. So it's, you know, it's pretty easy to use. It's just a powder. Um, yeah. So I just mixed it in with my warm, warm tea that I normally feed and uh, added it to, to one of my beds. And um, like I said, before I get uh, a considerable amount of iron already in my water. So I didn't, I used about uh, probably a quarter of what they recommended for just a normal system because I already know I have a lot in there. So I was not really concerned about that. But um, so, so far in my what to use category, I um, I actually went and got the whole box of stuff. I still have the the maxi crop 
um, powder, which is basically just a sea kelp powder. And uh, that's the same kind of thing as pretty much, uh, you know, you mix it in with a solution or you could top dress it, I suppose, if you wanted to. And, uh, you know, again, I just mixed it in with my warm tea right after I've already, you know, brewed it and got it all ready to go. Then I just add it right before I add it with everything else. So, I mean, essentially it's just food for microbes. And uh, then I have the raw um, microbial mix, which is uh, I'm not sure what to think about MPK after their whole, you know, their recent stint with their mega wash or mighty wash or whatever. But this is what I had at the local grow shop, which is basically just uh, microbes. There's a whole list on the back, uh, which are specifically designed for blooming, or at least what it says here. But we talked about it in one of the previous episodes when we did um did that and then of course in here i have the mammoth pea um and the modern microbes That's testers so yeah so i'm gonna um i'm going to make a alfalfa uh sst um i ordered some alfalfa seed that i'm going to use to make a sprouted seed tea and blend it up and then try to make essentially a mammoth pea culture since that's pretty much you know, for the most part, what they're they're putting in the bottle here is alfalfa extract in order to feed it on. So I'm going to see if I can create like a little homemade mammoth pea bucket. Let's see how that goes. The um, you want to explain to people what seed sprout tea is? I don't know if touched on it before, but um, sure. Yeah, it's basically. If you look up sprouted seed tea, that's what SST stands for. Um, and how to make it, there's a lot of different walkthroughs online. You can also go to the where I got the instructions to do it and the ones that I follow were in the um, Probiotic Farmers Alliance group on Facebook. It's in their resources section. It's uh, easy to join. You just search for it. And I'm, I don't even think you have to be approved. I think and even if you do, they're pretty quick about it. Um, and then, and they have a ton of stuff in the resources section. But for the most part, what you do is you have like a, some people do a rice wash, some people just use plain water, but for the most part, you're filling up um, a container, putting a bunch of seeds inside of it and letting them soak for, you know, probably, you know, usually for like seven to 10 days or until they're sprouted. Um, <clears throat> and I've done it to where they're, they're sprouting or they're even, you know, getting to the point where you would start transplanting them and they're getting to be, you know, like relatively good size. And then I throw them in a the blender and blend them up and fed them to my worms. That's how I had previously used them. Uh, and so now this time I'm going to do just a pure alfalfa one. I've done corn. You can do alfalfa. I've heard of a few other ones that people use, but you're basically just sprouting a whole bunch of seeds inside of a bottle and then blending them up and using um, all those enzymes that get released um, in, uh, from that are already contained inside the seed uh, and they're great for growth. And so in this case, I'm doing that with alfalfa in hopes to be able to allow the bacteria that's in my sample bottle to be able to breed and grow and be able to use a little bit of that at the, in each one of my teas to be able to continue breeding those microbes out, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, absolutely. So that's my plan for SSTs. I don't know, have, have you used them very much? I've used them for worm, worm feed quite a bit and I've used them on my outdoor soil grows um, last year. Um, but I've never experimented with like just adding them directly to a system or or anything like that. So I don't know if you have I've any. Never, I've never used them passively as a fertilizer. I know some people that have. I've always used seed sprout tea to germinate older seeds. Um, oh, yeah. It's a great way to germinate old, old seeds. You got Makes a sense. seed that's three plus years old, you know, and you're not quite sure it's going to germinate. Um, it, it's the way to do it because it has all those hormones that wake that seed back up and it, you know, that's all that is, is a collection of, of it in all that water, you know? So, um, you know, that's really what you want to, uh, to go with. And, and, um, you know, it really, really, really helps with those older seeds for sure. 
that's that's how it was first introduced to me and my grandmother my my grandmother actually grew up during the depression so they didn't really have money to do buy any of their own stuff so they made their own cloning gel out of um uh, willow fresh cut willow branches and concentrated and um you know they'd make their own insecticides and different insects out of um they make a nightshade tea out of potato and tomato leaves and some pepper, you know, hot peppers, uh, seeds, and, you know, just all different kinds of stuff that she brewed up and comp she compost teas and, um, you know, all kinds of different stuff that she introduced me to. And seed sprout tea, she taught me about the seed sprout tea when we were germinating some old vegetable seeds, but that was the first time I had ever been exposed to it. So. Yeah, it's supposed to release a number of different... Um enzymes like as soon as the seeds crack and as they and even as they start to grow and establish their first roots they're re releasing enzymes that um that i guess from what i read are in a lot of cases especially with i think it was it wasn't alfalfa and it wasn't corn i want to say maybe it was just like wheat or no, barley, that's what it was. A lot of them were using barley for their veg teas um, and, and being able to just, you know, essentially sprout a whole bunch of them. And then uh, those enzymes, when uh, they get released, and the reason they were adding them to their fermentations was that it was a nitrogen-fixing enzyme. But that was just what some dude posted in PFA. So I don't know if that stands up at all, but... That's part of what they were what they were doing with it. But in a um, the reason I was there and reading about it was that uh, they had some really good instructions for for how to do them and different ways of doing them and some discussion about it. So um, I haven't, like I said, I haven't added them directly to an aquaponics system. Although I'm confident you could, um, especially if you do like I did and blended it up and gave it to, you know, just put it into a grow bed, for instance. Um, you know, I'm sure it would dilute relatively quickly. It's pretty much like a, like a real thin mush for the most part. Um, one, you know, once it's blended up, there's really not, not much substance to it. So, um, you know, I know the worms love it. You know, they, they eat it up and, you know, see a huge push in population. Kind of like if you, you know, when you put coffee grounds in or something like that, that, um, you know, you can just see a big difference in their activity. Yeah, absolutely. So that's my sprouted seed tea experience. It's relatively limited. I've only been doing them for a little while. My buddy that's a, a big organic grower and been a member of PFA for a while and done his last few grows with that sort of uh, Bokashi style um, growing. He just set up some sips, some sub-irrigated planters out of some kiddie pools, and uh, some of that liner that I had, <coughs> I had here, and those are those are looking really great. I'm excited to see how those turn out. Nice. So, but, uh, you want to explain what sips are? Yeah, sips are sub-irrigated. Stands for sub-irrigated planter. So it's sort of I, I really look at it really similar to dual root zone. You know, in, in that you have a layer of soil up above, in this case, a, a small water reservoir that you basically keep full of anaerobic bacteria um, in a relatively low pH uh, to what, at what you're used to in a water reservoir and allow that bacteria to sort of um, take over that lower section. And then you're, for the most part, all of your stuff all of your nutrients are top dressed in, like when you start flower, they top dress with dolomite, and different things like that. So if you look up, like Earthbox is a great example of a sub irrigated planter system. They have the um, probiotic natural wellness garden, I think it's called. Don't quote me exactly, but I think it's, or maybe it's just a probiotic wellness garden. I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, it's um, the guy who does, uh, you know, sort of the professional level Grokashi. Um, the original, if you were, I think his name is Alan 
Alakinson or something like that. I can't remember right now. But anyway, he was the one that uh, posted all that and got together with Earthbox to create um, that that system. But you can even they've had you know Earthbox has had their stuff around for a little while now too. But that their combination project and they've had some great results with uh, with that. So. Um, you know, definitely check those out. It's a great way to get started if you don't have anything right now or you don't want to build an aquaponics system or you don't have room for it or you might be in a situation like Steve is where you're going to have to move it. So, it, you know, it's relatively easy to move. They're relatively small size planters and you, you know, it comes with all the instructions and it's really probably the, like, the simplest way to uh, just get started growing, like, quality probiotic stuff with a, you know, relatively low learning curve to where everything comes in it you just basically put it all together top dress a couple of things when they go into flower and make sure the that your uh, water is at the proper level and uh that, that's pretty much it so sub irrigated planter is not really that much different than a dual root zone in that um you know you have your top layer of soil and then the plants reach down through that soil underneath it to be able to to get their water and so 90% of the time your soil isn't even wet up at the top. And uh, so um, they have a term for it, I forget, like biomimicry or something like that, where they're basically attempting to recreate in nature the way that plants reach down into the water table below the ground to be able to pull up uh, water as opposed to rely on being top watered by just rainwater constantly. So. That's the, uh, I guess, the abridged version of sub-irrigated planters. Yeah, and for anybody that's been listening to Dude Grows, it's similar to the guy's, uh, Scotty's hempy buckets. Um, real similar to his hempy buckets. I haven't checked those out yet. I'll have to see what they're up to. But it, and like I said, it's really similar to do a root zone or whatever. Basically, you're just allowing the plant to reach through the soil and in our case you know when we're doing dual root zone where it's basically a giant dual root zone or giant sips for the it's an aquaponic sips technically speaking other than we don't we use anaerobic bacteria primarily to control our environment does that make sense yep So yeah, that's uh, that's probably about the only. I haven't had any questions or anything recently. Um, I haven't had anything today either. So uh, I think everybody's out on vacation and getting their groove on for the Fourth of July here soon. So I also don't know where Tyler went. He must have dropped off when we thought. Yeah, we weren't answering his question, but hopefully we did, Tyler. If you come back and listen later. Yeah. Um, we'll get uh we'll get some guests back on the show. Um I was actually hanging out with uh um Scotty from Dude Grows yesterday. Um uh hanging out for a bit, so um we'll be uh we'll have some guests, some cool guests for you guys here soon. But yeah, I was hanging out with him, talking about him with uh possibly a new project here going on in uh um in Denver. We'll see how things work out. Yeah, might have something in the works here. Um, scheming, always scheming. <laughs> it's important. Always trying to bring you guys more cool stuff. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's about it for me. So unless you got something else, I think that's oh, that'll be a wrap. I do. Um, Kia Life is giving us a bunch of stuff to give away. So... Um, uh, make sure you uh, like and subscribe to the channel and um, leave a comment. Um, leave a question for next week's episode. Um, and uh, we'll pick somebody that left a question and um, uh, and we'll uh, we'll give them send them some keto life stuff next week, okay? Um, they're gonna give be giving us some some giveaways for a couple of weeks and uh, and um, yeah, they're thanks for them for doing that and um, thanks for realgrowers.com and and dudegrows.com for hosting us. Uh, they host our podcast as well. Um, we also post some 
Uh, my buddy and I post some um, aquaponic blog content over there under the aquaponics section, so be sure to check it out. There's some really good articles on lighting and microbes and a bunch of other cool stuff on there. And um, yeah, shout out to True Aquaponics. They were on the show not too long ago. And um, Yep, and they were great with my order. Yep. I put it in. They got it shipped out right away. I had it within like two days and uh, was, you know, cheap and obviously it was what I ordered and so you know if you guys need any supplements especially if you're gonna end up having to order it anyway um, you know I get a lot of messages from people that are in outlying areas and stuff he'll he's got a lot of information about uh, you know like what ships and what doesn't ship and where to find stuff a lot of times he'll just say that it you know just let you know it might be easier for you to find it somewhere you know locally that you might not have thought of you know something they might have it like uh, i think steve was talking about the some of the stuff they have at the chicken feed store um <clears throat> where you can find a lot of bacteria and stuff that they use to help you know from a lot of different stuff um like anti-mite medication and different things like that so um so yeah definitely shout out to the guests on the show and um did a great job on our, on my order here so definitely check them out at the true aquaponics store um, if you need any supplements, it's a great place to find stuff that you know you can put into your system. Yep, that's another great option as well. Um, what else uh, is there? I think that's everything for now. Um, be sure to check out my uh, we have a website. It's Potent Ponics. If you want to write us a question, leave it in the comments. Or you can email me at potentponics at gmail.com or um, the you know million other ways you can get a hold of me um, Marty you and a you have your channel and um... yeah so make sure I posted the link to our Facebook group in the chat section so definitely it is up in that Facebook group it's aquaponic cannabis growers if you're just searching for it um, we, you know we post a lot of pictures to there in between shows and have a discussion outside of that so uh, any questions you have in between shows, you're welcome to post there as well. We'll try to cover those. Uh, my channel is AP Med, Steve's Potent Ponics. Subscribe to both of those. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Alrighty. Well, thanks to everybody for joining us this week. I'm sorry for the technical issues in the beginning. We were, we're having all kinds of problems, as you guys can see. So uh, we're just grateful that we were able to get the show off today. <laughs> at this point so thanks for watching and um, we'll see you guys again soon all right see you guys next week